Okay, let's take a look at our agenda. Uh, we're gonna spend a minute or two on the industrial ethernet landscape. So today we're here specifically to talk about ethernet IP. A few weeks ago, we talked about Modbus TCP, and I thought it would be a good chance to, again, spend just a couple minutes talking about the overall industrial ethernet landscape. Uh, that will help us lead into our um, exploration of ethernet IP, what it is, how it's used, all those kind of good things. We're gonna take a look at different types of Ethernet IP IO devices, or Ethernet IP devices, I should say. We're gonna, of course, talk about the support that our products have for Ethernet IP, uh, ways that you may apply them in an Ethernet IP environment. And for those of you who are new to Horner, um, don't get lost in the acronyms. I'll do my best to uh, keep those from being too big of an issue. Um, OCS is our main product line, Operator Control Station, uh, those are products which uh, have the functionality of a PLC with an HMI built in with IO and networking capabilities, including Ethernet IP. Um, and they're all programmed with a single programming package called Seascape. So when I say OCS, I'm really talking about any of our controller products, whether they have a screen or don't. Um, but uh, that's really what I'm talking about when I say OCS. So you can think of uh, PLC in general if you'd like. Uh, you can think of all-in-one controller in general if you'd like. Uh, that's what we mean by OCS. And then in addition to talking about the ways that our products can support this protocol, we also are going to show you how they're configured and programmed. So hopefully that you'll find that useful. And then as I've mentioned multiple times now, we will do our best to answer any questions you have at the end. Okay, let's, let's take a look at that industrial Ethernet landscape. This is not an in-depth dive, but just a quick introduction, a quick look at where things were and where they kind of stand today. So really, uh, my control career began in the 80s, so I have been around a while. And really for the latter half of my career, really the latter two thirds, uh, Ethernet-based networks have really dominated the industrial market um, in terms of the proliferation of more and more nodes. Um, and today there are more multiple industrial Ethernet protocols, and most of them are at least partially open. Keep in mind that, you know, 25 years ago, most protocols were proprietary. So things have definitely changed uh, over that time period. And then today, if you take a look at the networks that you most commonly find out there, uh, these are networks including Modbus TCP, which we talked about pretty extensively a few weeks ago. Uh, that had its uh, origins in Modbus serial protocol from the late 70s. Uh, Ethernet IP, which is what we're gonna talk about today, it had its origins with DeviceNet, um, a, a protocol that operated over CAN, still around but has faded considerably. Uh, it's been around since the 90s. Uh, Profinet, uh, another big industrial Ethernet protocol. Uh, it's related to, but not, uh, you know, it's related to Profibus. Whereas Modbus TCP is Modbus over Ethernet and Ethernet IP you can think of fairly accurately as DeviceNet over Ethernet. Uh, it's certainly not Profibus over Ethernet when we talk about Profinet, but they're definitely related. Similarly, CanOpen is another protocol you'll find out there and it is related certainly to CanOpen using a lot of the same messaging type formats. So that's kind of the players out there. Um, now let's take a look at, you know, market share. Let's just start with Ethernet in general or industrial Ethernet in general. So for every, I guess, node, if you will, uh, a factory automation device that is network connected, 64% of those uh, are currently uh, based around industrial Ethernet, one of those protocols we've talked about or one of the other ones that I haven't mentioned in terms of Ethernet-based. That means 36% of those are other. Um, dividing up that 64%, um, if you take a look at the market share, um, or at least a good part of the market share, still less than 50% though, you'll find that 17% of that is Ethernet IP, which we're going to talk about today. An equal share is with Profinet, 7% uh, with EtherCAT, and then 5% with Modbus TCP. Now that's with new nodes and new installations, not necessarily historical installations. So you'll find, um, you know, from a historical market share, those numbers are a little different. Now, in my previous webinar where we discussed industrial Ethernet, in that case, specifically Modbus TCP, we discussed why Modbus TCP was important. 
um, longevity, versatility, simplicity. So it's pretty important, I guess, that we also discuss what makes Ethernet IP important. Um, well, it's highly promoted by major players in automation. You've seen the market share, which is obviously market leading at this stage, along with Profinet. Um, it's a well-established industrial Ethernet solution, highly competent. It works, works very well. Um, it, one of the most important factors is it utilizes off-the-shelf hardware pretty much fully. Okay, there's almost no special Ethernet IP hardware that you need to buy uh, for an industrial Ethernet application. Now you might buy hardened Ethernet components, uh, but they, there's nothing really super special about them to make them Ethernet IP compatible. And it has continued to evolve. That's a strength. Um, they've added safety. They've added motion. So those are all, all certainly benefits. But if I were to take a look at maybe the number one factor last or a few weeks ago, when I talked about uh, Modbus TCP, I think I said the mo number one factor in terms of importance or why Modbus TCP was important was simplicity. There's always going to be a place in the marketplace for simple. Um, I think the number one thing about Ethernet IP is it's prolific. There's a lot of it out there. It's got the number one market share. Um, you know, it is is not the best technology, not bad technology, don't get me wrong. It's not the highest level of technology. It's not the highest level of innovation, but there's a lot of it out there and it works. So it's a reason why as a control engineer, you should pay attention to it. Okay, now let's dive under the hood a little bit. Now, I'm not gonna go into crazy amount of details with Ethernet IP. Frankly, there's a lot of details available, um, but hopefully what I'll give you is a good overview with a good level of detail to help your level of understanding. And there's plenty of resources out there from uh, organizations such as the ODVA, which is responsible for Ethernet IP, you know, and plenty of other, other places where you can find uh, more education to dive in even deeper detail than I may provide. But let's go into some level of detail. So what is Ethernet IP? We've talked about the commercial issues. We've said, yeah, it's industrial Ethernet. But really, a good definition, I would say, is it's an industrial Ethernet network that marries standard Ethernet technology with what's called the Common Industrial Protocol, or SIP. So when I say standard Ethernet technology, I refer back to what I was talking about a minute ago, and that is there's really nothing special hardware-wise that you have to purchase from an Ethernet standpoint um, to implement Ethernet IP. So it does a good job of implementing standard hardware. Industrially hardened in many cases, yes, but standard hardware. Now it has its origins actually in something called ControlNet. Now many of you veterans out there have definitely heard of ControlNet. It's still out there. Um, it's mostly been applied by Rockwell customers as kind of a high-end, highly deterministic network. Um, it was really, you know, back in the 2000 era, um, ControlNet was really envisioned as the high-level network for the factory floor of the future, and it was planned to be open. Uh, they weren't going to in, reinvent it from scratch, so they were reusing quite a bit of the messaging that they had developed with DeviceNet, just with a much higher performance uh, architecture. Um, and so what happened, though, as ControlNet was kind of being developed and being deployed, is that industrial Ethernet just exploded. And so it became pretty obvious to people that um, the attention needed to turn away from a, from a mass market standpoint, away from control net and towards an ethernet based solution. And so that's where ethernet IP kind of emerged um, as the uh, solution uh, by the same folks that developed uh, device net and control net. And Ethernet IP was fully turned over to the ODVA, which is the organization that runs all those, uh, all those protocols uh, in the 2000s. Now, getting back to uh, common industrial protocol and the definition of Ethernet IP. Ethernet IP, again, marries standard Ethernet technology with SIP, CIP, common industrial protocol. That same protocol was used by DeviceNet, ControlNet, and now by Ethernet IP and a couple of other things like CompoNet, et cetera. Um, so really, if you understand or have a working understanding of what SIP is and how it works, then you'll have an understanding of all these different networks. Um, and SIP really at its heart is a mechanism for organizing and sharing data in an industrial device. So 
It handles common data organization or defines common data organization as well as common messaging. We'll start with the data organization. Now, a few weeks ago when I talked about Modbus TCP, I mentioned the data representation of that protocol. It's very simple. Again, it had its uh, origins in the late 70s. Um, it's based really around a PLC memory architecture based strictly around words and bits. That was the Modbus TCP origins. Um, now, while Ethernet IP is hardly new, and SIP is really what we're talking about here before we dive into the Ethernet uh, version of it, um, even though SIP is not very new, it's still quite a bit newer than Modbus TCP, so or Modbus in general. So it is effectively um, uh, object-oriented. So the data representation is repre represented by objects. What are objects? Well, objects are a grouping of related data values, which are called attributes, in a device or node, okay? A class is a set of objects of the same type. An instance is a representation of a particular object within a class. And hopefully that diagram over there to the right kind of helps make these things a little more clear. And then attributes, again, are a data value in an object or a data object in a class, because a class of objects can also have attributes as well. So those are some common definitions around CIP or SIP uh, uh, from a data representation standpoint that will help with your level of understanding. Okay, now again, let's dive into more detail in terms of objects, these data representing objects. Let's talk about required objects uh, in Ethernet, I'm sorry, in SIP. Um, we have the identity object. And that's an object that basically says, who is the vendor that manufactured this device? What's the serial number, that sort of thing. There's a message router object, because remember, uh, it's object oriented not only from a data standpoint, but also from a messaging standpoint. So you have to have an object that can allow messages from object to object, um, so that's a required object. And then you have a network object, which provides the physical connection info, such as, you know, uh, baud rates and, um, you know, IP addresses and those sort of things that are tied to the specific physical connection. Um, so in addition to the required objects, you also have vendor specific. Uh, those allow, you know, vendors to create special features unique to their products that are built into SIP compatible products, um, but they have to be accessible. These special features and, and objects have to be accessible using standard SIP techniques and standard SIP messaging. And then you have, I think most importantly, although none of it would work without the rest, uh, application objects. And we're gonna dive into quite a bit more detail on application objects. Okay, so application objects define the data in the device, okay? And they're specific to device type and function. Um, and all SIP devices of the same type must contain the same application specific objects. And what we have there to the right is a chart or a table showing a partial list of application specific objects. So you see things on that list such as a discrete input group, um, an ACDC drive, uh, a presence sensing um, object, those sorts of things. Now taking that one level further, you have device profiles. So that's a series of application objects for a particular device type that defines a device profile. And again, on the right, we've got a partial list from the ODVA of device profiles. Those include things like, you know, AC drives or pneumatic valves, a position controller, um, an encoder, that sort of thing. So these are all predefined and established by, um, you know, the ODVA group that manages SIP. Um, and if you are a user who is, let's say, using an encoder on your machine, and you might want to use encoders for multiple manufacturers, if you're using uh, Ethernet IP uh, compatible or SIP compatible encoders, uh, then when you change from one manufacturer to the other, the way that encoder is addressed, the way that encoder is accessed, is going to be very similar from manufacturer to manufacturer. So um, again, that's device profile. All right, now let's talk about a special type of objects called assembly objects. These are really super objects or a superset of objects. So what an assembly object is, it is a convenient package for transporting data between devices. So, um, and it contains multiple attributes uh, from typically more than one um, application object. 
Um, and it's really the place where devices exchange data. So, uh, for instance, an assembly object more than likely is going to contain uh, an input assembly that has a collection of input objects, an output assembly that's a connection of output objects. And if you're using an OCS in a SIP protocol um, and it's communicating with some sort of third party device, maybe a third party PLC over that same protocol, and it's a SIP based protocol, you're going to be exchanging data through um, input assemblies. Or I'm sorry, through assembly objects, including input assemblies, output assemblies, et cetera. Okay, so that's an important thing to, to kind of understand. When it comes time to uh, map the exchange of data, uh, that's an important concept. Okay, and then a couple more things about how data is organized. Um, if you want to call out a specific piece of data in a SIP device, you really need to know what the class, instance, and attribute is for that piece of data. And then, whereas we talked about a few weeks ago that Modbus really was all designed around word type and bit type data exclusively, and everything else has been kind of added on over the over the top over the years, um, Ethernet IP as well as SIP in general um, support you know a bunch of different data types ranging from one bit to 32 bit, um, showing at least 10 here on the screen. So a little bit more data, lot more modern data handling. Okay, now we've talked about some of the object-oriented aspects of data within SIP. And again, SIP is just what, what uh, protocols like Ethernet IP are based on. Let's talk about the two most common connection type and messaging types um, uh, with SIP. First, let's talk about explicit messages. These are messages uh, that are asynchronous in nature. So they're only sent on an as-needed basis. Uh, maybe the tuning parameters for a PID loop. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, they're strictly point to point, okay? So they're not one to many, they're one to one. They follow the request and response model, okay? Um, and they're called explicit messages because the message itself explicitly states the object and service that is being requested. So um, that information is all contained in the message um, when the request is made. Okay, that is different than implicit messages most often called real-time data messages that are sent on a continuous basis and they follow the producer consumer model that could be unicast one to one could be multicast one to many uh, potentially could be broadcast also um, and only data for the most part is sent within the message which means the meaning of the data is established ahead of time so uh, the full definition of though what data is, is desired is not contained um, inside the message. Uh, therefore, it's implicit um, and it's established ahead of time what that data means. So at this point, we've talked about Ethernet IP from the standpoint of the general market. And we've talked about SIP, which is the underlying object-oriented data and messaging structure. Let's now complete the picture by examining the marriage of SIP with Ethernet. So in the seven layer open systems model, SIP resides at the application layers five, six, and seven. Layer four is where the transports of TCP and UDP come in. Layer three is the internet protocol layer and Ethernet IP uses IPv4 addressing. And layers one and two are the Ethernet physical layers. From a port standpoint, there are two ports to mention. For explicit messaging, those are the messages that are occasional and asynchronous in nature. TCP IP is used with port 44818. TCP IP messaging takes a fair amount of overhead, but that is okay because these types of messages are only sent occasionally anyway. For implicit messaging, the IO type messages that are sent on a continuous basis UDP and port 2222 are used. UDP makes sense here since it has less overhead. Unlike TCP, UDP has no guarantee of delivery, but that's not a problem because if an IO type message is lost, there is always another one coming around the corner in a few milliseconds. So that is a view of Ethernet IP from a seven layer OSI model standpoint. There are some significant features and benefits to this model and this approach. It is built on standard Ethernet and can use standard Ethernet infrastructure components. It coexists well with other protocols like HTTP for web browsing 
FTP for file transfers, and many others. And because it uses standard IPv4 addressing, it can be structured into subnets and bridge those subnets seamlessly. Not all industrial Ethernet networks can claim all those benefits. Some trade off improved performance for custom hardware. Some don't play well with other application protocols like HTTP and FTP. Now let's take a look at the four different device classes for Ethernet IP, because not all devices are designed to have equal capability on the network. At the lowest level, we have an explicit message server. These devices act as targets for explicit messages. This is most commonly seen by simple devices such as those that serve up ASCII data, maybe like a barcode reader, RFID reader, or similar device. Next up is the I.O. server, most often called an I.O. adapter. This is the most common type of Ethernet IP device. These devices are not only the target for the occasional explicit message, but are targets for I.O. messages as well. Examples of these devices include temperature controllers, variable frequency drives, and more. This is the device implementation most often used with our OCS all-in-one controllers as well. Explicit message clients are less common. They primarily are used in an HMI-like capacity to read and write information from other devices using explicit messaging. Our OCS products have some of this capability. Lastly, there is the I.O. scanner. This is the most sophisticated device from an Ethernet IP standpoint. They act as the originator in connections with other targets, effectively allowing communications to occur on the network. So what device classes do our OCS all-in-one controllers and RCC remote controllers support? The most common application is the OCS or RCC acting as an I.O. adapter. That means that our product can exchange data at high speed with an I.O. scanner like a Rockwell Logic CPU. That's the application OEMs using the Horner products need the most often. Let me give you a use case. Let's say I'm an OEM that utilizes the Horner XL4 all-in-one controller to run my industrial oven. Some of my customers who buy my oven want to interface with Rockwell-based systems they already have in the plant. My oven is attractive to them because of course I make a great oven, but also in part because the Horner controller offers Rockwell connectivity without the Rockwell price premium. So I set up the XL4 in this case to act as an IO adapter through Ethernet IP. I configure it to share critical process parameters, status, and alarm data. This data is available to the systems in the plant, which are designed to gather its information over Ethernet IP. The next device class supported by Horner All-in-One controllers is the Explicit Message Client, which can be thought of as an HMI class. With this functionality, an OCS can have access to the global tags in the Rockwell Logics processor. That data can be read and written as needed tied to standard objects on the graphics screen. If I choose to take it one step further, I can even map those Rockwell tags to internal OCS memory addresses. So I can now perform more than just HMI functionality, I can use that data in my logic, perform data logging, WebMI web serving, and more. And I don't need to choose between having the Horner controller act as an IO device or an HMI device, I can configure the Horner controller to be both at once. Those of you who are saying, well, I would really like the OCS to be able to act as an I.O. scanner and effectively run an Ethernet IP network, uh, maybe because you use drive adapters or other specialized products which have Ethernet IP interfaces and they're not available for a wide variety of other uh, field bus networks. Um, what about that scenario? Well, in that scenario, we can be an I.O. scanner, but only when we're connected to a third party device that acts uh, in that capacity. So. Um, we have interfaced before in applications with companies, IO scanners like uh, Real-Time Automation. Uh, they're a great uh, company that specializes in communications out of Wisconsin. Uh, also with devices from Hillshire, as well as HMS. So um, again, if you need the OCS to be the uh, IO scanner on an Ethernet IP network, it's definitely possible, but it does require a piece of third party uh, hardware to do that. Okay, now let's talk about the steps required to use an OCS as an Ethernet IP I.O. adapter. Um, and the whole idea behind this approach is to allow an OEM, a machine builder, 
to offer a easy, effective connection of their equipment uh, to an end user's Ethernet IP network. So let me give you an example. An example might be, you know, maybe I'm an oven manufacturer. I manufacture industrial ovens, and I have several of my customers that uh, want to buy my ovens, and they have Ethernet IP networks and um, hardware in their plant, uh, and they would like to be able to read and write process data as well as alarm data, et cetera, from my oven and have that data shared over uh, from my oven over Ethernet IP. Um, so that's a typical uh, use case. Um, the workflow is, first step is the OEM is going to need to configure the controller for Ethernet IP operation, and that's performed in Seascape. Um, and then once they've developed their application and they've got all the process data and alarm data and everything else they want to share on that network, then they just need to document that, you know, what those variables are, where they're located in the um, uh, in the data flow, if you will, um, and then publish that information so that their, their customers can, you know, extract that information um, and use it in their application. And then the last step is really on the user side, where the user will take the OEM's published documentation and then configure their Ethernet IP scanner uh, to grab that data and uh, map it into their uh, overall control system. So I'm just going to quickly run through the steps in Seascape to, to perform that. Um, I do have a, a, a live demonstration that I will go through. Hopefully that we won't have any technical issues with that. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on these slides. But in general, uh, the process for the first step of configuring your OCS controller for Ethernet IP, um, first thing you're going to do is you're going to open up Seascape, which is our programming package. Uh, it's a free software package used to develop applications with our products um, and it performs all network configuration functions in addition to everything else um, and part of the network configuration function is configuring ethernet ip so you're going to dive into the lan configuration in seascape make sure the lan ports are configured you're going to check ethernet ip which is one of the resident protocols that's supported by the controller uh, you're going to configure what's called the input assembly. In other words, the data the controller is producing uh, back, to the, um, uh, back to the network scanner. Um, so that is called the input assembly because it's always uh, from the standpoint of the scanner is how it's defined. So this is data published from our controller to the scanner. It's called an input assembly. And you can have up to 128 words in and out. Okay, similarly, you're gonna configure the output assembly. And then lastly, you're gonna uh, configure a status word so that you can uh, see precisely uh, maybe when communications could be lost and then be able to react appropriately if that were the case. Okay, let's go ahead and show you how to do that in Seascape. Okay, let's go ahead and demonstrate how we can enable Ethernet IP as an I.O. device uh, for a typical Horner controller. In this case, I'm looking at an XL4, uh, which is one of our more popular controllers. And we are going to go ahead and enable Ethernet IP as an I.O. device. So we start here in the hardware configuration. Okay, so I've got an XL4 here. Uh, I'm going to go under LAN1 config. All right, now I'm going to the need to configure uh, at least a minimal amount of network functionality or Ethernet functionality in order for Ethernet IP to work. Um, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and just use the defaults. In a real application, I wouldn't typically do that. I would assign tags or um, variables, if you will, uh, to IP address, net mask, et cetera. So all those things could be changeable from a screen um, at the application uh, touchscreen. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to leave it at the basic default Ethernet configuration for IP address and net mask. All right. Now, to go ahead and enable Ethernet IP, all I have to do is just make sure this Ethernet IP checkbox has been checked. Uh, while it's highlighted, I press configure selected protocol. All right. Now it's a matter of assigning uh, the starting variable or the variable array effectively. Uh, for the data that I'm going to be producing. Keep in mind that's my input assembly. 
because remember the assembly is always referenced from the point of view of the scanner. So my input assembly is what I'll be producing and my output assembly is what I'll be consuming from the scanner. And I'll be assigning variables here, array type variables, as well as the number of consecutive words uh, in that array. So that'll make up the total size of my input assembly and output assembly. Okay, let's go ahead and assign our variables. Starting with my input assembly, which is the data I will be producing. I'm in the tag based version of advanced ladder here. So I'm going to browse my tags. Now I had previously created a variable called EIP input assembly. That is an arrayed word type variable. I'll select the first instance here. I'm going to set my length to 64 because I'm going to be producing 64 words. Next, under my output assembly, which I'll be consuming, I'm going to browse my tags and select EIP output assembly. Again, the first element there. And in this case, I was prepared to consume 32 words of data. And then I also need a status register. I'll browse my tag for that. That's just a simple word type register and away you go. So I've now completed uh, the configuration on the OCS side for the OCS to be a Ethernet IP IO device so that it can sit on a customer's Ethernet IP network and my OEM machine uh, now has the ability to uh, exchange data uh, with the customer's control systems in their plant. Okay, now let's take a look at the next step, which is uh, the matter of really documenting the details of your input assembly and output assembly, or at least the contents of those that you're gonna be publishing for your machine. So effectively, it's really just a matter of documenting where each shared machine variable is located within the input and output assemblies. In that previous example, I used an array, I believe of 64, uh, produced words and 32 consumed words. Um, and that additional information beyond and uh, above and beyond where each of your machine variables are located are gonna be the specifics that the customer will need when they're configuring um, the uh, uh, software to configure their scanner to talk to uh, the controller, which is our OCS uh, in the machine, okay? And the steps for configuring on the most typical scanner would be a Rockwell scanner. So these are the steps that would be required in the Rockwell software. So as an example, using RS Logics 5000, uh, you go to the IO configuration, uh, you right click under ethernet and press add module. Um, and then you, uh, there's a very lengthy list of items to select from. Uh, you can most easily just hit in search, uh, type in generic, and it'll come up with the generic Ethernet module, which is what you want to select. Um, you're going to assign a convenient name, okay? Uh, it could be Acme Heater, could be a variety of things. In this case, we just used OCS, all right? So you just assign a convenient name. Now, this will be the prefix for the tags that get automatically created later. So that's one th important thing to be aware of when it comes to assigning a name. Uh, you need to fill in the IP address for the OCS. You need to fill in the assembly instance details. So it's always going to be assembly instance 100, okay? And then the size of the uh, of the instance is going to be, or the size of the assembly is going to depend on how many words were allocated, or double words in this case were allocated. So that's going to vary by application. Uh, the output assembly is always assembly instance 101. And again, the size is going to vary by application, depending on how the OEM configured Seascape. And then there is no configuration assembly, so you just type in a three with a length of zero there. Okay. Um, and the next step, really, and just about the last step, is to configure what's called a requested packet interval, and that is how often the data is to be sent. Um, and 10 milliseconds is a good typical value for that. So every 10 milliseconds, this data is gonna be exchanged both directions. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a tag creation uh, that happens automatically in the background. 
The tags will have the prefix of the uh, name of the device, in this case, OCS, uh, for, the, for the, the Horner device that was configured here. And those are just automatically added by the software. Okay, so that's the process that's involved in, in its entirety uh, for allocating produce and consume data, uh, which is the input and output assemblies uh, for Ethernet IP so that the OCS or a similar Horner device can act as an IO device on an Ethernet IP network. Uh, the next implementation we're going to talk about allows the OCS to have access to the global tags that are residing in the logic CPUs that are on the network. Uh, now, this is required or a prerequisite for this to work is you have to have access to the program in the Logix CPU. And again, Logix is a family of CPUs from Alan Bradley, from the Control Logix and Compact Logix, et cetera. They have native Ethernet IP capability and they they can you can uh, query their tags over Ethernet IP. So that's a function we built into the OCS. Um, so this isn't really generic uh, uh, message reading and writing. It's specific to uh, the Rockwell processors, but let's face it, the most prevalent Ethernet IP uh, scanners out there are Rockwell processors. So the, the once you've set everything up, um, you're going to get a pretty fast update time. You know, you're going to get you're going to get data updating. You know, every 25 milliseconds or so. And even though it's technically not real time data that you're after here, you know, it might be more set point and alarm data and those sorts of things. You still have the ability to uh, you know access it pretty quickly. Uh, the general workflow, as I mentioned, you do need to have access to the program that's in the Logic CPU, or at least what's called an export file or an L5K file uh, from the RS Logix 5000 program. Um, and that, so if you don't have necessarily have control over that program, but you want to be able to access tags within that CPU, uh, you could contact you know whoever does have control, integrator, customer, whatever the case may be have them send you a copy of the L5K file, and that gives the secret sauce, if you will, to be able to access all the, um, access all the um, tags within the processor. Okay, um, once you have imported the L5K file, then you have the option of individually mapping those tags to OCS register space. You don't have to though, and I'll go through that in a live demonstration here shortly. Um, and then also, uh, if, whether you choose to map tags individually to local OCS register space or not, even if you don't decide to do that, as long as you import the L5K file, you have access to those tags from the screen in the graphics editor. And we'll demonstrate that as well. Okay. All right, now we've got a new project here. Uh, this time, instead of using the XL4, I'm going to illustrate using the EXL6 uh, as a HMI type device on Ethernet IP in order to exchange Logix tag data uh, with a Rockwell processor. So again, we're gonna start at the hardware configuration. You can see here I've selected an EXL6W. Uh, if we go here under the Ethernet configuration, Okay, you'll see that I have fully configured Ethernet in this case. Now, you'll notice I am in the register-based version of Advanced Ladder here. Uh, we are not yet supporting uh, Logix Exchange with tags with Service Pack 3. So that will be coming, but it's not here yet. So I'm going to illustrate this process from the register-based version of Advanced Ladder. So the prerequisite for supporting Logix-based tag exchange this is going to be making sure that my Ethernet is fully configured. Um, and I'm not, in this case, if I'm not also supporting the OCS as an I.O. device on Ethernet IP, then I don't need to check this. Now, keep in mind, I can both be an I.O. device on Ethernet IP, and at the same time, I can also exchange tag data with a Logix CPU. Uh, so that is not a problem if that's what I want to do. But let's say in this application that I'm strictly acting as an HMI over uh, Ethernet IP. So I'm going to leave that alone for now. Okay, now currently uh, in the Seascape configuration, uh, to support exchanging global tags with a Logix CPU, 
uh, you need to, first of all, you need to have what's called an L5K file. That's an export file from a Logix 5000 program uh, in the Rockwell system. Uh, so that's a prerequisite. I have to start with that file. So if I'm in control of the program that's in the Logix CPU, no problem. Um, if I'm not, if I'm doing an integration job or something, then I need to make sure I have access to that L5K file so that I know or have the ability to import into uh, Seascape and ultimately to the OCS uh, what the global tags are uh, from the uh, processor I'm going to be interfacing with. Okay, so currently uh, you access the L5K import from within Seascape. Uh, currently from the program menu, you'll see import tags from L5K file. Okay, I select that. And this dialog, uh, L5K tag import, pops up. Okay, so I'm going to start by importing the device. I press this button here. Okay, and I find my L5K file. There it is. Okay, press open. Okay, so the first thing that pops up is it gives me, uh, extracted from the L5K file, it gives me the name of the controller that I'm importing, as well as as IP address. You can see a quite interesting IP address there. Okay, and you'll notice the port number assigned to that particular CPU. Now, that happens to be the same port number that's uh, by default used for um, exchanging data over Ethernet IP using the explicit connection. But I don't need to change any of this. I can just say, okay. All right, now once I've done that, you'll notice that under the devices area here, I have a new line that says sample or the name of the CPU along with its IP address. And I have a little plus here that I can expand and included in here are the controller tags. I can expand those as well. Now, this is the global tags uh, from this project. And as you can see, it's a massive project with a total of four tags. So we have machine RPM, machine start, machine status, machine stop. Okay, if all I wanna do is use the OCS as an HMI, then effectively I'm done. Okay, I've imported my L5K file. It's shown up here successfully. I can press okay. Uh, now, I go to my graphics editor and I start building screens like I normally would. Now you'll see here that I've got a motor control area on my HMI program that I've previously configured. I'll go ahead and double click on this start button. And I have originally assigned it to an internal bit uh, here in the controller. But now let's say that instead of it being mapped to an internal bit, let's say I want to map it to a global tag from that Logix processor I just imported. Okay, so up here under data source, instead of selecting internal registers, I'm going to, from this pull down, I'm going to select sample, ETN1. Now, what's ETN1? ETN1 is the Ethernet port that that sample uh, processor is connected to. So if I had an XL7 or a 10 inch or 15 inch OCS, I would have two Ethernet port, so I'd have to make sure that I was configuring it on the proper one. Okay, so again, I've selected my CPU, and now I just need to browse for the appropriate tag. How do I browse for the appropriate tag? Well, I just press this right arrow button here, and up pops a dialog that allows me to browse the tags. Now, in this case, it's easy to browse because there's only four tags, but machine start is what I'm looking for, so I say OK. And OK, and I'm done. All right, so my start button now, instead of being locally assigned, is now assigned to one of those tags that I'm exchanging with that Rockwell CPU. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for the stop button and for the RPM meter. So again, I'll double click on the stop button. Instead of internal registers, I'll select sample, which is my CPU name. I'll press the right arrow, which is the tag browser. Expand, expand, machine. Stop is what I want, hit OK. One last step, let's go ahead in and let's reassign RPM from a local register uh, over to uh, a tag from that CPU. So again, sample, hit the right arrow button, expand, expand, machine RPM is what I want. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, one thing, that you'll notice is that was a pretty easy way to map data from a Logix processor directly onto the screen. So uh, that was really quite easy.
But let's say that we want to do a little more. Let's say we want to go a little further, that maybe we want to take some of that tag data and do data logging, or we want to take some of that tag data and use it in our logic. Well, we can't do that if we're just in an HMI. So what we need to do is we need to get that data uh, from just being a Rockwell tag and map it into OCS register space so we can use it as an internal OCS variable and use data logging or logic development or whatever the case may be, utilizing that same piece of data that originated or its destination in the case of an output uh, as a tag in the logic CPU. Okay, so to do that, to take that extra step, we go back into the program menu, go back to import tags from L5K file. Now we don't have to re-import anything, we've already done that. We have uh, effectively imported the L5K file. What we do need to do though, is we do need to go ahead and map over the tags that we're interested in. Okay, so let's say that uh, for the sake of argument, uh, we wanted to map all these tags. Well, there's only four of them, so why not, right? So I'm gonna go ahead, select the first one, um, I also need to assign a starting register where those can be mapped in the OCS register space. So um, let's go ahead and put them somewhere else besides register one. Let's put them at register 2001, and they're all going to be put in one block. Um, we'll start with machine RPM, hit the add button, move to start, add, status, add, stop, add. Okay, so we've added all of those. Um, and they're all mapped into OCS register space starting at register 2001. Okay, so we hit OK. Now, where do those variables go? You know, we know they're mapped starting at register 2001, but, but how does each one map? And if I had a dozen or 500 tags that I was mapping in, it would be hard to keep track maybe of which tag was mapped into which register space. Well, one thing I have the ability to do is I can go into, and we're going back to the hardware configuration, back into the LAN configuration. Now, if you'll notice, everything looks pretty similar as to when I left it last, except under downloadable protocols, I now have uh, an entry here that was not there before. Ethernet IP client uh, with network devices and scan lists, just like any other downloadable protocol. Now, in the case of this downloadable protocol, there's nothing to configure under network. All that information got pulled in with the L5K file. Nothing to configure under devices, same thing there. And in the scan list, even though there's nothing there to configure, it is a convenient location I can use to kind of show the list in order of all the tags as they were imported. And it shows not only an index for them, so the first one here, index zero, is gonna be at the first register I assigned, which was register 2001, and they'll count up from there. Um, now, it also shows us whether that particular tag was mapped as a double word or as a single word. Boolean type variables come in as words. So they're gonna come in as the least significant bit uh, in the word, whereas uh, the other type variables are all gonna come in as double words. Okay, so this is where all these tags now have been mapped, starting at register 2001, how um, much space they take up, and we can take it from there. Okay. So that is effectively the final step in not only allowing the OCS to act as an HMI over Ethernet IP, but also taking the extra step of mapping those tags over into local OCS register space. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> that is all I wanted to cover. Day. So just as a quick, um, a quick review, we talked about Ethernet IP uh, as it relates to um, other industrial protocols in terms of market share, some of the origins of all of those. Uh, we talked about what is the messaging and data representation of Ethernet IP under the hood. It's really something called SIP, CIP that has its origins in device net and control net and some other things. Uh, we talked about uh, the different messaging types, explicit and implicit messaging, um, and we talked about the different implementations, uh, including as an IO device um, and an HMI device and as a scanner device. Um, and the fact that the OCS can only be a scanner with a third party uh, add-on.
Okay, so let's see if we have any questions. Again, I apologize for the dropouts. I'm sure um, there's gonna be a lot of comments there. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. What is the reasoning for the L5K file being necessary? Um, well, basically that's where we can access the details that allow us to um, send the proper messages to get the actual tag information. Um, because unlike the old days, when or even the Modbus days, when you take tags and you map them to physical memory locations, uh, that doesn't always exist in modern PLCs, especially tag-based ones. So you have to have some way of uh, differentiating or some way of specifying the specific data you want. And that data that, that is there for all the tags, the details behind the tags, uh, that's contained in the L5K file. So that's kind of what, what that's all about. That's why we need that. Um, let's see, uh, any other questions here? Um, thank you for answering the poll questions. Um, we have a second poll question for those of you who, uh, who are either thinking about using Ethernet IP or who have used Ethernet IP. So if you could answer that before you take off, that would be much appreciated. Um, let me see if we have any. You had one question right at the beginning. Oh, okay, let me go back to that, thank you. Okay, please explain HMI with multiple controllers distance a kilometer between them. Okay, sounds like somebody has an application with a lot of distance. Um, well, what I don't know is the networking infrastructure that might be available in that application uh, where you have um, multiple controllers distance the kilometers between them. So I'll talk about some possibilities. So um, a kilometer, um, technically, you, you know, if you were running new cable, um, you could run fiber and have uh, some sort of uh, ethernet-based fiber solution. That would be a potential possibility if you have the ability to run new cable. Um, it would be extremely expensive, but possible. Uh, you could run uh, CAN cable, uh, thick CAN cable with a couple of repeaters to be able to bridge a kilometer. Um, depending on the kind of response time you need, you could go with some sort of wireless network. Uh, there are a variety of wireless networks that are available with different bandwidths and different reliability levels and those sorts of things. Um, so there are a variety of options, but a lot of it depends on what infrastructure is available to you or that you may already have or have the ability to add in the application. I hope that provided at least some level of, a, of an answer. Okay, I think that, that's it for our questions. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. It was bound to happen one of these days. Um, thank you very much for attending.